If the United States of America ever had a representative crazy uncle figure, it might be George S. Patton. Well, at least that's what the 1970 biopic Patton says about him. If you hadn't seen Patton, and you know a lot of my audience is younger males, you ought to give it a try. I think it's going to appeal to you. Let's take a look at what makes this movie great and why you should watch it. Coming up next. <laughs> Right, so Patton is a 1970 biopic, wonderfully acted and memorably acted by George C. Scott, who plays General Patton. And know that this movie was also co-written by Francis Ford Coppola not long before he made The Godfather. Then the movie kind of assumes you know World War II history. It may be good to brush up on it. It would be interesting to see, if you don't know anything about World War II, how this movie watches to you. It starts in 1943, with General Patton receiving the tank command of of an army in North Africa for the Americans. And this movie really presents fragments from Patton's career in World War II just from 1943 to 1945. You see, Patton go against the great German tank commander Rommel in North Africa. Then you see the invasion of Sicily by the Americans and the British. Patton then goes north to England and awaits his orders for D-Day. And then later he's commanding the Third Army in France and Germany as the Allies march toward Berlin. There are a lot of war scenes in this movie. There are a lot of scenes with Patton to show you his eccentric character. And if you watch this movie for only one reason, it's to see all of the one-liners or two-liners by Patton in this movie. Tell me, General, what do you think of Morocco? I love it, Excellency. It's a combination of the Bible and Hollywood. This movie is really a complex portrait of an American male or a certain type of American male. The rascally, stubborn, prima donna, foul-mouthed warrior who can do anything, who will do it himself if he can. The movie, and I think really the script, makes the case for Patton's real complexity and as i think you watch this movie you'll see this movie i think longing for more patton like figures although you may not watch this movie as being sympathetic with patton i do it does actually argue that america needs more patents or america needs to recognize the united states needs to recognize more patents and let them do what they do best. Now among the things that this movie says about General Patton is that he was a crazy uncle figure. He did lots of strange things, he believed lots of strange things, he said things that got him into a lot of trouble. You want to see me, General? Oh yeah, Chaplain. I'm sick and tired of Third Army having to fight the Germans, the Supreme Command, no gasoline, and now this ungodly weather. I want a prayer, a weather prayer. I don't know how this is going to be received, General. Praying for good weather so we can kill our fellow man. Well, I can assure you, sir, because of my intimate relations with the Almighty, if you write a good prayer, we'll have good weather. Number two, Patton is a romantic warrior, a man born in the wrong century. This is funny in the movie because General Patton actually believes in reincarnation. He believes he's been reincarnated time and time again as a warrior in different famous wars. We've been told about these wonder weapons the Germans were working on. Long-range rockets, push-button bombing, weapons that don't need soldiers. Killing without heroics, nothing is glorified, nothing is reaffirmed. No heroes, no cowards, no troops, no generals. Only those who are left alive and those who are left dead. I'm glad I wanted to see it. And he says over and over again, I hate the 20th century. I don't belong in this century. Part of the reason for that is he's always being harangued and he's always being put down by gigantic bureaucracies. The movie pits the individualistic Patton, the local genius who understands how to maneuver his tanks, how to command his men at a local level and win the battle versus giant bureaucracies which are always pushing him down, seeking glory, seeking for, you know, political political solutions, and worrying about public relations. Well, I'm no diplomat. I'm a combat soldier. That's all these jokers understand. I think that's another way of seeing the portrait of Patton. He's this great man. He's a great man in an interesting time, but he's constantly being thwarted by other people, vainglorious people, not unlike him. He's a man who thinks he's destined for things, but also is creating his own destiny. 
And I think one of the things this movie says that Patton is really more closely aligned to an ancient warrior tradition going all the way back to the Greeks and the Romans. In the movie, he's always talking about what the Romans were doing, the Carthaginians, the Greeks, the French during the Napoleonic Wars. General Patton is a figure who would fit in very well to Homer's Iliad. He is like a soldier, a general, a fighter in the Iliad come into the 20th century. There's no wonder he doesn't work well with John giant military bureaucracies, giant political bodies, super states like the United States of America wants to tell him what to do. But you know what? He always knows best and he loves fighting. And when they don't want him to fight, he's very annoyed by that. Now I'm kind of making Patton seem and sound like a barbarian and he is and he knows that he is on one half. But there's another half to Patton which is that he is very civilized. And throughout the movie, you're going to see him in one way as a man in the wilderness or in the wild by himself. But the other half of the movie, you're going to see him as an individual in these grand palaces, in these great architectural spaces in Europe in particular. He's a highly civilized man. He's a poet, for example, quoting his own poetry. He's sort of a religious believer. He can recite the Psalms from the Bible. And as I said, he believes in reincarnation. He also knows French fluently. So what this movie has is a representative type, the barbaric American in Europe, in European soil, and it's doing the contrast game with what's an American versus what's a European, how are they similar, how are they different. In this movie, the barbarian crazy uncle figure patent helps liberate thousands of European towns, especially in one of his favorite places in France. So this is in part a war movie. You will see tank battles, but I find it better to think about this as a very complicated portrait. You know, you may never have done this. Go to any art museum. They're gonna have lots of older portraits of people. Most of those portraits seem like they're nothing. But a great painter can get all the ambiguities of a face and of a body into the painting to make you see complexities in a person's character. It's exactly what this movie does, but it doesn't just have, you know, one still frame like a painting. It's got a number of great scenes with Patton himself. We are advancing constantly and we're not interested in holding on to anything except the enemy. We're going to hold on to him by the nose and we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time and we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. And because, as the movie actually says, poetry has gone out of fashion in the 20th century, Patton is not going to be sung by the great poets of old as the warriors in the Greek and Roman times were. No, he's going to be sung here by cinema and by this movie in particular. And by sung, I don't mean that he's praised all the way. I think he's blamed for a lot of things that he did, but he's supposed to be a great man and a great figure no matter what. And I think you need to think about this movie in this way. This is 1970. This is an American movie. The question then is, what is this movie, Patton, about World War II, saying about the Vietnam War? Now, it never brings up the Vietnam War directly, but there are hints, I think, all over the movie that what the Vietnam War does not have are men, particularly generals and leaders like Patton. By 1970, you had tens of thousands of American men you know, killed in the Vietnam War. At that point, what are we fighting for? Lots of protests, lots of problems in the United States because of the lack of the will to win the Vietnam War, or even to know what that war was about. Then you had this movie come along and depict you know, the greatness of an American during World War II, but you know what? He's thwarted in his will and desire to win the war. For example, early in the movie, he's commanding a tank army, and right underneath him is General Omar Bradley, his second in charge. Well, guess who gets put in charge of the forces in Europe? It's not Patton, who's seen as too wily and out of control. It's General Omar Bradley. This movie has then an interesting conundrum of the inferior becoming the superior, and Patton having to work for him and under him. I don't find this to be a top tier, even a second tier great movie. In fact, there's a number of clunky things in it. You know, this movie has a two hour, 50 minute run time. This movie was made during the heyday of long movies where they put an intermission in the middle, two and a half, three hour movies that really didn't need to be that long. I find this movie ought to be cut by 20 to 25 minutes. There's a lot of scenes with Germans and Nazis in their headquarters just talking. They're just frankly boring and unnecessary. But several of the great things about this movie actually have nothing to do with the director. First is the script. Great script here by Francis Ford Coppola and Edmund North. 
And they have in this movie all kinds of memorable scenes with Patton. Just look at these three quips uttered in just two minutes of the movie time. Good. Stick with us. We'll take you right into Palermo. Uh, Colonel Davis told us around your quarters, General Patton, and I was interested to see a Bible by your bed. You actually find time to read it? I sure do. Every goddamn day. Palermo's the most conquered city in history. First, the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Carthaginians, the Byzantines, then came the Arabs, the Spaniards, and the Apollo. Now comes the American army. General Alexander, sir, reminding you that you are not to take Palermo. Send him a message, God. Ask him if he wants me to give it back. Another great thing, as I said about this movie, is the performance by George C. Scott. Extremely memorable. Probably the only person who could play this role well. If you don't know George C. Scott, go look him up. One of the great but yet forgotten actors. Third thing I love about this movie is actually the score by composer Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, a lot of complexities to it. One, there's this echoing trumpet line that comes up, first of all, to talk about the historical aspects of Patton and his love or interest in reincarnation. Score also has a great militaristic theme, a patriotic sort of theme, but when that is played in the movie, I heard a lot of dissonances in there. And so it was really interesting to hear this score sort of stick out for me as I rewatched the movie. The movie has a huge scope and production size, all kinds of tanks in this movie. I'm not sure how they did this and paid so much for it in 1970. And to be frank, this is one of the better looking Blu-rays I've ever seen. Extremely crisp looking. I'm very curious to see how a lot of the audience for this channel watches this. You know, we got a lot of 20 year olds, a lot of males, like 75% of my audience at this moment is male. And you look at how Patton is portrayed in this movie. He's funny, he's cynical, he's sometimes bitter. I see a lot of stuff on the internet about guys wanting to be sort of bronze age males. And you know what? This movie beat you to it. And so while Patton is not necessarily a great war movie, I do think what it is is a great individual portrait of a particular man over the span of three hours. If nothing else, this movie will get you very interested in reading about the actual General Patton. And the movie does hint very very subtly at the possibility, as remote as it is, that Patton was actually assassinated. He was a great man in the wrong time, but nevertheless did great things. He was a screwed up idiot and he knew it. The movie criticizes him, the movie loves him, it's worth, therefore, a watch. Have you seen this movie? It's now 50 years old. What do you think about it? Let us know in the comments. And if you haven't, please subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much. Have a great day. The Greeks, the Romans. Carthaginians. God, how I hate the 20th century.